Good morning. My name is Kyle Gatlin, and the label that I have before you today is pastor or senior pastor. All of us have labels. All of us have labels in our lives. We, we have usually started out with them really young, and they sort of stick with us throughout our years, or we get labeled different stuff throughout our years. As we age and as we go through different stages of our lives, we all get labels. Some of them are actually good labels. Some of them are bad labels. Some of them can actually pretty, be pretty dangerous labels. Maybe in school you've been labeled a goody two-shoes or a snob or a jerk or a nerd. You know, some of those things could follow you all of your life. Maybe uh, like some of you in high school, maybe the senior class voted on different people's labels, you know, the best personality, the funniest, the most athletic. You know, you go back to your yearbook, you can look at those and go, yeah, that was pretty right. They were that. Sometimes those labels follow us, sometimes they don't. But sometimes, sometimes you get a label and you just have to live with it. And you can be stuck with it your whole life. On January 1st, 1929, a guy by the name of Roy Regals got a label that stuck. It got that stuck. This is the Rose Bowl. University of California was playing Georgia Tech. This was, you know, this, this was probably the only bowl game uh, that was of meaningful consequence during this year at the end of the 28th season. And so the first half was going on. Roy played both ways. He played the center on both. It was literally called center on offense and defense. And, and Georgia Tech had the ball. They ran a sweep to the left, and the ball came loose. Roy picked it up, got knocked around a couple times, and then proceeded to run over 60 yards toward his own goal line. His own teammate called him literally at the one-yard line. And unfortunately, the, the, the damage was done. The coach decided to try to punt it away quickly so nothing bad would happen, but the punt was blocked and there was a safety. The final score of the game, Georgia Tech won eight to seven. And so, <laughs> with one Georgia Tech fan in here, said, yes, I were, that was the last time we won. All right, so, yeah, no. so uh, that was that literally was the difference in the game. And wrong way Regals was born. Wrong way Regals. Now, how in the world does somebody in 2022 know about wrong way Regals? 45 years ago, I read that story. 45 years ago, I read that story. There's been over 4,500 stories written about wrong way regals. Sometimes labels just stick. There's not much you can do about them. That was, that's a, sort of an innocuous label. It, you wouldn't want to be called that, but there's other labels that actually can do some damage. In 2017, Miss Iraq posted a selfie of her and Miss Israel at a beauty contest. And this was the picture that she posted. And she said, peace and love from Miss Israel and Miss Iraq. From that posting, she was labeled a betrayer to Iraq. That she had no, just that she, she, she loved Israel, that she uh, had no sympathy toward the Palestinians. Her family had to leave Iraq because of this simple posting, and she was labeled as a betrayer. Here's the deal you can be labeled, but you're not limited. You see, when we get some of these labels in life that we can, it, it can sort of pigeonhole us if we let it. You know, if, when, I, when, I was, when I was younger, I was called shrimp or something like that. I know Bobby Brady was too, but I think I, I was too a number of times in my journey as a child. I was really small for my age, still am, and so, and I'm, I'm shrinking. Did it, do you know that? Do you know you shrink? I was, thought I was small before, now I'm shrinking. So anyway, so I'm still small. 
And so I, I had that sort of that label. I was sort of the, one of the smaller kids in, on the football teams and stuff. And so I, I, I tried to overcome that. I did pretty well most of the time. Most of the time I came over, overcame that. But, but so many times that, that we, we get this image of ourselves, but either because we give it to ourselves or because somebody else gives it to us, and it limits us of what we can do and what we try to what we, we hope to accomplish. We, we feel limited because of that label. And, and I will tell you, for years, I'm, you know, I've, been, I've been in ministry really since 1987, uh, actually 85, 85, 86, 86. I was, I've been working at a church in some type of ministry since that time. And, and I've really, there, there's been times where the label that, that I put on myself, not anybody else, the label I put on myself, I felt I limited myself because of the label. Like, for instance, when my first appointment, the first church I served uh, as the pastor was in Florida, and, and I would say something to myself like, I'm just a pastor of this small church. And then the same way in Montgomery, I'm just a pastor of this small church. And then, then when I come here, and I come across people that that when I tell them I'm, my label is the associate pastor, that, that I get one of those, huh, you know, type things. And you've been there, you're still an associate? I mean, I, I got that. You're still an associate after 10 years, after 15 years, you're still an associate? Because there was a stigma that some people had. And, and, and I felt seriously at times that I, I limited myself. Sometimes it was backed up, back in the... Um, 2000s, uh, somebody would call and inquire about having their child baptized, and, and uh, the person who's scheduling those would say, hey, with this, yeah, this date's open, you can come, but just let you know, the senior pastor, Hayes McKay, will not be there. And they said, then I don't want to do it. What they were saying is they don't want Kyle to do the baptism, right? That, that's what I read into that. And so I, so it, I, I limited myself. I, I really did. I, I had that label of associate pastor. And, and I felt that times it limited me on what God could do in my life. And, and I don't know if, if any of you are going through that or, or have gone through that, but, but I want to tell you that there's hope contained in God's word today. Because we're going to look at a lady who dealt with a terrible label in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It didn't matter what she has done. She got stuck with this label for the rest of her life. And we're going to look at how she was not limited on how God could use her. We're jumping into Joshua chapter 2. And we see our introduction to Rahab. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. I purposely changed the pronunciation of that. No, I'm just kidding, okay? I have no idea how to pronounce it. I'm pronouncing it in a way that will not get me kicked off of YouTube, I guess. I don't know. All right. Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of, of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. So that's our label, prostitute named Rahab. What's going on? Just to, just to bring you up to speed, Israel's getting ready to cross the Jordan River, getting ready to take the land that God has promised his people, that this is Canaan, this is the land that my people, the Israelites, will inhabit. They will take over everything you see, every place your foot has put, put down, that you will have. And, and the people of Israel could have just simply said, hey, God's going to do this. Uh, we don't need to do anything. God, we're just going to walk right in and God's going to take care of it. No, that's not the way God works. 
Because e- even though God, you, you may or may not have been promised something, if God promised you something that was going to take place, you still have to do your part. And so here's what the deal with, with Joshua and the Israelites. They've got to do their part. They've got to do their due diligence. We still have to investigate. We still have to go into the land. We've got to scout it. We've got to see what we're up against. Jericho is going to be one of the first places we take. And we need to know what, who, who the enemy is, what their defenses are, how many peop, men, uh, fighting men they have, all that stuff. That's just being smart. That's not, that's not doubting God. That's just working alongside God in this whole deal. And so these two spies that Joshua sent, the first place they entered was Rahab's house. Now, this is just me spitballing a little bit. I, I'm not going to read anything into why these two guys went to the brothel, okay? Except maybe that's where strangers and foreigners frequented, and they were just trying to blend in. I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt, right? That's, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. But it didn't fool the king. Somebody, somebody recognized, hey, these Israelites went into Rahab's house. So, so they knew. They knew that these spies from Israel were at Rahab's house. Okay, now we're going to go through the story in bits and pieces today, but here's what I want you to know about Rahab. God uses the most unlikely people to carry out his plan. God uses the most unlikely people to carry out his plan. Because we're going to see Rahab in God's plan. We're getting ready to see that. And that's where we're going to get, where we understand where she had this label right? But it did not limit to what God could do in her life and God, what God could do through her. But she really was the most unlikely of persons to do this because she really, she had three strikes against her. First of all, she was a Canaanite. She was living in the, she was a foreigner. She was a person that was not going to be in that land much longer. God had already said, we're going to get rid of everybody in these lands, these Canaanites, they're going to get out one way or the other. They're going to leave or they're going to die. That was pretty much the only two ways they could come out. And we find out there's a third way called servitude later. But that was basically that they needed to get out. She was the enemy. Canaan, Canaanite people were the enemy. They were on the land that was promised to the Israelites. Second, she was a woman. In the culture of this day, I hope you understand, just the way it was that the, the women were not viewed in high esteem. It was all male-dominated society. That's just the way it was. And and even the biblical language and the biblical stories, the people that God used, by and large, the vast majority of them were men. And that's just, just the way it was. And, of course, the third thing was she was promiscuous. Okay? Uh, That's sort of a nice way to say it. But I didn't want to use the other P word for fear there may be younger people in this audience that will go home and, and asking the parents, what does the other P word mean? All right? So we still have a young people in here, so I'm trying to keep it as G-rated as I can. Although there may be some people asking about that word as well. So good luck, parents. I'm sorry. That's just the story in the Bible. That's, you're going to have to deal with it. And God bless you. God bless you, however you deal with that word in whatever way you do, all right? She, very unlikely, three strikes. She should have been out, but she was in. She should have been out, but she was in. And, and this, this really is just par for the course because God uses unlikely people. Moses led the people out of Egypt. He was a murderer. David had a couple strikes against him. He was a young shepherd boy. shouldn't have been called on to kill uh, Goliath, the giant. Then he was, as a king, was a murderer, but God still kept him and used him as kings, as a king. And then um, the shepherds. When Jesus was born, the shepherds, night shift shepherds, they were the lowest on the shepherd totem pole. They were bad there were people, people looked down on anyway, but even the night shift shepherds were even the lower class citizens, and God used them to reveal himself for the very first time to the world. And then my favorite story, which was uh, shared in our Stranger Things series earlier this year, God used a talking donkey. 
God used a talking donkey. This should give hope to every one of us. If God can use a talking donkey, surely he can use me. Insert your pun there. Okay, because I, I can't do it. I've been told I can't do that anymore, so I'm not going to do that anymore. All right? But you're probably thinking, hey, you don't know, Kyle. You don't want, know what, what kind of label I've been dealing with, what I've been labeled and in, in what I've labeled myself, because you don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've done. There's, there's no way God can use me. God uses the most unlikely people. God uses the most unlikely people. And he uses Rahab. So, so if we look at Rahab's story, we, we not only, we, yeah, we see what she is, but now we see what she is going to become. Because here's the next thing I want you to remember about this story. You can't change where you've been, but you can change where you're going. You, you can't change where you've been. You can't change the past. It's done. But you can change where you are going. And we, we look in verse uh, 12 and 13. Remember that the spies are in her brothel. She hides the spies up on the roof. Okay, I'm, I'm telling you the story rather than reading it. She puts the spies on the roof. The king's guards come looking for the spies. She diverts them, sends them off. They say, oh, they left. They're gone. But they're on top of a roof. So she hides them. She saves them from being captured. And technically then lowers from the roof and then tells them where to go and spend the night for three nights before they go home to, uh, to, to Joshua and give a report. So, so as, she, as she has hidden them, and before she sends them away, she says this, Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them and that you will save us from death. I thought it was interesting that she was only including herself at the very end. Everything before that had to do with my mother, my father, my brothers, sisters, their family. Then she included, oh, and save all of us. I thought that was very interesting the way she, she worded that. Because here's the deal, she knew. She knew what was coming. And she knew that her past pr probably wasn't going to mesh with Israel's people. She knew her past and who she is as a Canaanite and her whole family wasn't going to be welcomed into the nation of Israel. But here's what she knew. I want you to understand this. I'm going to read this. And this is all in chapter 2 of Joshua. And you can read this on your own. But here's what she recognized about God and his people. She told them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea when we, we heard of the other conquests that they had fought. Uh, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God in heaven is above and on the earth below. Okay? For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and the earth below. Here's what she knew about God at this point. Understand this. She had some understanding about the God of Israel. She knew what God had done, parted the Red Sea, had been with the Israelites, and the word had spread about how the God of heaven and God of the earth below had been with the nation of Israel. So she, she knew this, and she knew that, that the only way for her to have hope down the road, to live down the road, to live in the future, was to get past her past and do something to change what was coming next. And that change took a step, a step of faith, of about knowing about God and really 
what is going on here is she moves from knowing about God to knowing God. That's what changed. She didn't change her past. Who she was, done. Done. And that, and that label, she, she lived with that label her whole life. But when she moved from just knowing about God then to knowing God, that changed her direction. That really changed her direction. It, this, this reminded me of some other people that, 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 that had to deal with where they were and where they had come from. But they made a decision to change where they were going. These are the lost children of Keturah, Paraguay. And I've shared part of this story before, and this is just a little bit more about it today. Uh, in Keturah, Paraguay, there is a large landfill, the largest dump, basically, in Paraguay. And there is people living in the dump. They've made their homes out of stuff from the dump pile, from the rubbish. Children are born and raised in the middle of this garbage pile. People make their living from going through other people's trash. And there's children in there. They cannot change who they are, but they can change where they're going. And a number of them have by being part of the landfill Philharmonic, an entire orchestra built from the scraps in the garbage pile. Watch a little bit. La orquesta de instrumentos reciclados es una orquesta que toca instrumentos hechos con la basura. Un, dos, tres. Y mi vida sería sin la música estaría decorable. La gente se da cuenta que no tenemos que tirar la basura muy fácilmente. No tenemos que desechar a las personas muy fácilmente. You can't change your past, but you can change where you're going. We shouldn't throw away people. We could, shouldn't throw away people. And the wonderful thing is about these, a number of these children have been in this orchestra for years. Gosh, they've gotten to see the world. Their literal future has changed because them coming together as part of this orchestra, as they were in this together, it really changed the direction of their lives. And this coming and being a part of other people is the last thing I want to remind you of because you tie yourself to people who are going the same direction. You tie yourself to people who are going the same direction. Listen to this part, verse 17 and 18. Now the men had said to her, the men, this is the spies, the spies that she had saved, the spies that she was getting ready to let down outside her window so they could escape and get back to Joshua. Now the men had said to her, this oath you made us swear will not be binding unless, unless when we enter the land, when Israelite, Israel invades Jericho, okay, you have tied the scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And then he said, unless you have brought your father and mother and your brothers and all your family into the house. Right? She, she she had to put this cord down to signify, hey, I am with the people of God and the people of God are with me. She was tying herself to the people of God with that scarlet cord. See, she was tying herself to people that would change her future, that would change her direction in life. What happens when you tie yourself to people who are God's people? What happens in your life when you tie yourself to people who are following Jesus? What happens? 
if you read the rest of this story, and we'll hit on it in, in a few weeks, her life was spared. Everybody in Jericho died except her and her family. They were spared. Her life changed because she tied herself to people who were God's people. What happens? What happens when you tie yourself to people who are going in the same direction? You know what? You get connected to Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. Matthew records the genealogy of Jesus. He starts at the very beginning and goes all the way. It ends with Mary and Joseph and Jesus. And here's he said this, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Jesus' great, 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 grandmother, right? I can't count them all. There's too many. Was Rahab. And when you tie yourself to people, God's people, you get connected to Jesus. And, and when you tie yourself to people that, that are going a direction that you want to go, that, that honors God, you know what else? You end up being in the hall of faith. Hebrews chapter 11. This is the hall of faith. By faith, the P word, Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. She's mentioned. Has that label. She can't shake the label. But her faith changed the direction of her life. Tying herself to God's people changed her direction and gave her faith because she just didn't know about God. She ended up knowing God, and God used her. Used her. And no, no matter what, no matter what your life has been labeled. It can be changed forever. James even includes her in the way in, in this. In James, he says, in the same way was not even Rahab the label considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. When she put down that scarlet cord, that tied her to people that would change her direction in life. That would really change history. What will your scarlet cord be? What will your scarlet cord be? What will be that sign that, that you are tying yourself to something that will change the direction of your life, that, that, will, that will include you in the hall of faith. What will that scarlet cord be for you? It may be simply being in a group that prays. It may, it may be being in a group of people that are serving. It, it may be reaching out and saying, I want to help with the students, and I want to be a group leader with the students, like Shannon and Andrew. Or I want, to, I want to be with those kids, those young first, second, third graders. They need some examples. I want to tie myself to that group of kids to point them to Jesus, and we all can go in the direction that honors God and, and points others to Jesus. It may be simply that, that you tie yourself to, your, your red cord could be, Consistently being in worship, consistently giving, that could be the red cord for you. Or it could be as simple as this. You know what? I'm going to tie myself to others who believe that this is not just God's word, but the word of life. Life-giving words. And if I believe that, if, if this is my cord, then then I'm tying myself to the Assembly of God church across the street. 
I'm tying myself to the church 30 miles from nowhere that it takes 10 turns to get to from here. Because they're, they're the people of one book. They're believing what God says too. But that this contains the word of life and the words of life to live by. I want to revisit wrong way Regals. He went to halftime. He was upset. He was very despondent. He had his hands, you know, he's just like everybody else would be. He just, he's very upset and frustrated. And the coach walked over to him. The, the, the whole, whole uh, locker room had been silent. They were getting ready to go back on the field. The wa coach walked up to him and he said, Coach, I've ruined you. I've ruined my life. I've ruined the University of California. And the coach said, Roy, get up and go back out there. The game is only half over. The game is only half over. Roy played with such vigor and, and inspired play that he was actually named to the Rose Bowl Hall of Fame. Not for that one play, but for everything else he, has done, he did in that game. He didn't let that define the rest of his day in the Rose Bowl, nor he let that define the rest of his life either. He actually had a pretty good um, humor about it. Georgia Tech made him a letterman, and he said, I earned it. You know, so. But, but whatever label you've been given, whatever label you have given yourself, don't let that limit what God can do. Don't let that limit what God can do because God's only limited by your availability. I hope you understand that. So if you have a breath left in you, if you have one more second of your life, get up and go back out there. The game's only half over. Thank you, God, for this day. The day that we have to be reminded that we are not limited because you are not limited. Now, we confess that too many times we have thought less of ourselves, that, that maybe we've labeled, us, labeled ourselves a failure or a fraud, but yet you think of us as a friend, one that has such vast potential to be used. And God, may, may our eyes be opened, may our hearts be opened to how you want to use us no matter what we think of ourselves, no matter what others think of, our, think of us. Because when you look at us, you see a child, your child, one that you desire to have a blessed, fulfilled life that is not limited by a label. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.